Okay. So um, thank you guys for, for joining today. I don't know why I haven't thought to do this before um, a webinar, which is these are the presentations that I give at conferences. And um, I'm glad that I can kind of deliver it to you in the comforts of your own home. So today we're going to be work, um, we're going to be learning about healing trauma with equine assisted learning and mentorship. And this is how I feel like we can play a role in ending our foster care crisis. So imagine right now the police came into the room that you're sitting in and imagine they removed you from your computer. They told you that you were going to be going with them. Imagine that they took your personal belongings. So you're not taking your phone with you uh, and told you that you wouldn't be able to contact your family. You wouldn't be able to make any arrangements. They bring you to a new home where there are other people that you don't know. You're not sure if they just got there like you or if they've been there for a while. And then you see one guy who's obviously in charge and he tells you where you'll be sleeping. He tells you what he expects of you. He tells you that um, you should be sleeping with all your clothes on, including your shoes every single night. He also expects that you eat everything with your hands, no utensils, and you have to walk everywhere in this house backwards. If you resort to your usual way of doing things, he will take it as a sign of disrespect. You'll essentially be perceived as bad or unable to assimilate. You have no connection to your old world and you're not sure if you will ever be able to go back to your computer where you're sitting right now. There's nearly 500,000 children in the US foster care system who have been removed from their homes. Many have experienced a situation just like this, which I call the different planner, planet exercise. Uh, they're not just removed from a bad home. You're removing them from the only parents that they've ever known, from all of their norms and their cultures, and we expect them to just adapt to a new environment, most often many new environments, and can you imagine being a child during your core stages of development being moved from home to home, having to learn what your role is and what's expected of you, what makes each person happy and how to be a good kid? I personally can't, um, I can't relate to that, but it absolutely breaks my heart and that's why I do this work. So I'm Rebecca Britt, I'm the founder and author of Stable Moments. Um, I started training horses off the racetrack in my teens and I learned about the principles of natural horsemanship where you use herd psychology or how the horses naturally communicate with each other to partner with horses rather than the traditional like we're going to break this horse. And I went to college to be a social worker and although I had zero desire to work with kids in foster care or adoption. The only job hiring in a recession was a post-adoption case management position. And I didn't really know what that was. But what it meant was that after parents had adopted, they were often severed from all the services that their kid was getting while they were foster parents. So they felt super isolated and on their own, and they had to deal with their child's behavioral issues um, or their child's trauma. And by the time adoptive parents were calling me, they were ready to give the kids back. So my job was to teach them trauma-informed therapeutic parenting techniques to ultimately keep the children in their home. My goal of my role was permanence, to make sure that kids stayed in the homes in which they were adopted into. So through my work in this job, I learned the principles to use with children who had suffered trauma, and I learned that they were nearly the identical principles that we use in natural horsemanship. So I just felt like it was so natural and I felt called to get these two populations together. So I moved to Georgia. Um, I was a social worker in Vermont, born and raised in Vermont, but I moved to Georgia and started volunteering at a local horse rescue where I started matching up foster kids with horses. I just said, hey, can we, can, if I hang out at this um, horse rescue, do you mind if I let a foster kid come and brush a horse? And they said, sure. Well, that service grew and grew and I wasn't able to keep up with the demand and I had a full-time job and I was meeting with 12 different kids and that's 12 different hours a week. So that's where the community mentorship piece came into this. Um, and so I figured if I could get mentors to do this work, 
that we could serve a lot more kids. And so that is how Stable Moments was born. So in today's discussion, you'll learn how a mentorship program paired with equine assisted learning can empower children surviving with early developmental trauma to make healthy transitions into adulthood. You'll learn about the impact of trauma on human development, why horses are so important to the work, and the importance of mem mentorship. So children who have experienced early developmental trauma are at greater risk for incarceration, unplanned pregnancy, homelessness, drug addiction, and dependence on state su subsidies. This is a cycle that impacts everyone. This is our culture. These are people in our society. These are services um, that require tax dollars. This impacts absolute everyone. And we see these um, kids grow up and have their kids entering care as well. So it's a vicious cycle. Children from tough beginnings have what we call early developmental trauma. And I wanna make this distinction because uh, we hear trauma all the time, right? Trauma, 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 and like uh, a lot of people have trauma. Um, and there's a lot of different populations you can serve and say that you're doing trauma-informed work or say that you're, you're um, serving people who have trauma. But what, when I use the word trauma, I'm speaking specifically to early developmental trauma. So, you know, you could have trauma from going to war. Um, you could have trauma from one incident. You could have medical trauma from having a terminal illness. You could get in a car accident. You could be sexually assaulted. All of those things are traumas that definitely need, um, that should be, have, you should be able to offer services to those things or those people should be able to get services. But early developmental trauma is caused by neglect, abuse, and abandonment. And it happens during the core years of development. So we're talking in utero to eight years of age. And um, a lot of people think that like, oh, well, I got her at birth, so sh she's, she should be fine. But the most vulnerable time of a child's brain is actually in utero. So if mom's in a situation where she's not getting good nutrition or she's using drugs or she's in a domestic violence situation, that's critical time for that brain to be developing and those babies often have results of trauma um, and long-term implications of trauma, even if they are put into a healthy situation as soon as they are um, born. So that's why uh, the Stable Moments Program serves foster and adopted children. So this early developmental trauma, it creates core feelings of worthlessness. These children think it must be me. They don't have a way of thinking, oh, my mom's irresponsible and she should have changed my diaper by now. No, as they sit in their crib with a dirty diaper and they're crying and they need to be fed and nobody comes, they start thinking there's something wrong with me that I can't get my needs met. I don't deserve to get my needs met. So, and there's research to back up that, this ha that these thoughts can start happening at three months. In fact, a baby that doesn't get its needs met within the first 30 to 60 days of its life will stop crying. And that's why you can go into orphanages and you just see a bunch of babies that aren't crying because they've learned it doesn't work. So they might be sitting there with sores or dirty diapers or hungry or with bugs crawling all over them, but they have stopped crying because they've learned it doesn't work and their voice doesn't work. So their voice is gone. And they believe that they don't deserve a voice. So the impacts of this, children who suffer neglect or abuse in early development, they miss crucial milestones. So they are not building a secure attachment and trust with their parents. So um, with babies, how they learn is they cry, we come. They cry, we come. And they start to learn how to regulate their body because they have the stressors of needing something. So they start crying and they become red. And then you come into the room and you give them a bottle or you hold them or you make them warm and now they're okay. So they start learning this trust with their, what we call attachment figures. Those are usually their parents, but whoever is raising them. So they get this secure attachment and they are able to regulate their nervous system that's kind of setting off alarm bells every time they need to eat because they can't grab a snack, right? They can't change their own diaper. So it starts to regulate 
you, you act as that regulation for them. Um, and kids that don't, like they cry and you don't come, they stay in that heightened state of I need something, I need something, I need something, and they don't get regulated. They don't get somebody to come in and make it okay that balances their brain, brain chemistry out or balances that nervous system. They just kind of stay in this state of I'm not okay, and that doesn't allow them to build attachment and trust. In fact, it builds distrust, um, and these kids usually have more of anxious attachments, like they are anxious because they wonder when somebody's going to come back, um, or avoidant attachments. They just learn, you know what, my voice doesn't work. I don't care if you come or not. And those are the kids that are sitting in the corner that don't have a reaction to whether you're there or not. So typical kids get nourishment, care, play, engagement, right? When we see a baby, pretty much any of us, if we see a baby, like, and I have a 10 month old, I'm just starting to realize how natural this is for all of us. I walk through Sam's Club with this baby and I have grown men and women like turning into blubbering idiots because they're like making goofy faces and trying to be silly with my baby. And I love it because we're obviously naturally inclined to do these silly things with a baby that are actually super critical to their development. So when we mimic a baby and they start to interact with them, they start to learn emotion, they start to learn interaction, they start to trust that, and they trust people, and they trust that they're worthy, and they trust that they have a voice and people care about them. And when kids don't get that, it just adds to their worthlessness feeling. One really um, easy uh, example I can give you of a crucial milestone that you'll miss is the teddy bear game. So. You take a baby and you go, here's the teddy bear, now it's gone. And the baby like, oh, where'd it go? And then you bring it back up and they're like, oh, there it is. And you go back and forth. There's the teddy bear, now it's gone. And you start, you're actually developing in that child object permanence, which is the, the principle that when things go away out of our vision, they still exist. And that's huge, right? Because now we start knowing as a kid, when things go away, they still exist. Your world's a little bit more stable, right? If we want to know when we drive into the driveway and we park our car there that when we get up for work in the next morning, the car is going to be there. It would be a pretty unstable and anxious life if we had to worry about if our car was going to be there or not. And that's just a really simple example. So these kids, not only, don't, you know, not only do they not get the teddy bear game, they don't get somebody that's helping them learn object permanence, they actively get people that mean a lot in their life or could mean a lot in their life, like their mom or their dad, leaving and not coming back. Or uh, leaving and then grandma comes back and grandma comes back two days later and then you know cleans the dirty diaper and gives them one bottle and then maybe a boyfriend takes over so there is no stability for these babies to be able to develop properly and finally repair so um, repair happens with a healthy kid um, like typical parents aren't perfect, right? We all make mistakes. So our babies are going to fall down. Um, bad things will happen. We even leave them at the store, right? We forget about them. These things happen. But what do we do when we make these mistakes? We swoop in. Oh my gosh, sweetheart. I'm so sorry that happened to you. That should have never happened. I shouldn't have let it happen. I should have kept you safe. You must have been so scared. Okay. And what does the kid learn in that moment? The kid learns okay that was scary but mom's here she'll make things okay a big thing they learn is it wasn't my fault that shouldn't have happened to me somebody should have protected me i'm valuable i'm worth something but these kids get abused or neglected and they're never told that this is should not be happening to them in fact a lot of times they're told it's because of them this is happening so they don't learn proper repair of relationships they don't know for them, when things go wrong, things aren't going to be okay, and they're probably the reason it happened. So this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. These kids know to the core fiber of their being that they are worthless. So when we come in to their lives and we say, you're valuable and we love you, those things are threatening to their core belief system that they know they're not valuable. So these kids usually push and push and push until we do something that shows that we don't love them and they're not valuable. And usually to them, that can just mean, that's it. 
you're done, or you getting frustrated, or go to your room, or I'm sending you back uh, to Department of Children and Families. And that, in that moment, even if it's just you raising your voice, saying, why would you do that to one of these kids? Right in that moment, they have said, I knew it. I knew I was bad. I knew all of that, you know, it could be months of you telling a kid that they're worth something. And now you've validated for them what they know is true, that they are worthless. So they push and push and push. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They usually are able to get attachment figures in their life to, do, to snap because they're good at this. And they can't make meaning of their world. So where a typical kid gets to do these like, gets to be curious and appearance around keeping them safe and they get to like watch interactions and not worry about their survival but watch interactions and explore their world and they start learning like what makes people frustrated and what makes people happy and they can make all these connections in their brain these kids don't get afforded that opportunity they're always in survival mode so their brain isn't going into this like curious playful let me explore my world they're, they're like I need to get my needs met all the time. So they, they don't make meaning of their world. So when we put expectations on them of like, why would you do that? Or didn't you, didn't you know that this would happen? It's like, no, sorry, they didn't get the time to be able to develop you know, rational thoughts like that. And these kids are hyper vigilant. So um, they always are in that fight or flight and they have to remain hyper vigilant to keep themselves safe because they can't rely on other people to do it. So they're always wondering, how is their world changing? Do they need to protect themselves? And this is where being easily triggered comes in. And I have a lot of people that will ask me like, oh, these kids are easily triggered. So we're gonna try to find their triggers and, and not do those. Well, if you know a kid's triggers, yes, but it's, it, it's too difficult to try to find all of a kid's triggers because guess what? They might change every day. Um, and you never know what's going to trigger a child. Um, I've had a bonfire at the barn one night and the next day was sessions and the kid could smell the residue of the bonfire. And I didn't realize that that kid's boy mom's boyfriend had set the house on fire while they had been in it. Those are things that, you know, you never forget when you learn them, but it was more important about how I process that with that kid um, than, it was for me to always avoid these situations. So an example I'll give you of being easily triggered is um, the, a kid that is used to their dad coming home after they've been put in bed and when they hear their dad come home and they hear a beer crack, they know that they're in for a rough night and their dad usually drinks and goes up and beats on their mom and the kid usually goes and hides in the closet and falls asleep there hoping that the dad doesn't come into their room. And then that happens over and over and over again. They get conditioned to this cracking of the beer, meaning really bad things. And so when they are in the lunchroom at school and somebody cracks open a Coke, their brain cannot decipher between a Coke and a Bud Light. So they are automatically triggered by that Coke opening and they don't think, oh, now I think my dad's going to be. No, they just have a physiological response that says, I need to get somewhere where I'm safe. So these are the kids that run to the janitor's closet and hide out in there and they're seen from their classmates as weird. And then usually teachers will even go in and say, why are you in here? You're not supposed to be in here. And the kid can't answer why. And now the kid's a liar and the kid has no clue why they got into the closet. It was literally a, a survival mechanism that their body had created. Um, I went into several school systems as a social worker to try to help them understand that the child's not gonna be able to tell you why they did what they did. So, the solution. The Stable Moments model matches up one foster adopted child with one community mentor, one horse, one hour a week for 10 months has a structured curriculum with individualized plans of care, color-coded activities, and data collection tools. Why horses? I probably don't need to tell you guys on the line why horses are so impactful to people in general, but specifically for these kids. They are hypervigilant, just like these kids. They can sense small changes in energy and they change um, their behaviors based on this energy. 
You guys know that these, the horses sleep standing up, they twitch their skin when they have a fly on their back. So they're super vigilant to their surroundings. They're much like children surviving with trauma. They need to know that you're not a threat before they fully trust you. And when you're going to get desired results out of horses, they want, you have a better chance of doing that by partnering with them. So correlations between natural horsemanship and therapeutic interventions for these kids are that non, it's non-punitive. So in natural horsemanship, it teaches you if a horse is running the gate or if a horse uh, is scared to go through um, a puddle or something, we're not going to say like, you idiot, and beat them over the, you know, the puddle or whatever. Um, same thing with kids in trauma. If they do something, we're not going to say, go to your room or that's it. We're not going to show them that we are punitive or upset with them. Uh, with both natural horsemanship and therapeutic interventions for these kids, it's all about the relationship. At the end of the day, if you didn't get over any jumps and you didn't do whatever barrels you wanted to do with that horse, but that horse trusts you more, then you've done a lot more than you would have done had you just forced the horse to do what you wanted it to do. Same thing with these kids. If all you do is give them an ounce of building trust with you to a point where they can start having stability in their world and start to explore and start to get curious and figure out who they are, you've already won. So the relationship's the main goal. Same with both horses and these kids, life or death mentality. If a horse says that they are scared to death to get in a trailer, we don't beat them into the trail. We take it at face value. The truth is that the horse thinks it's going to die. When a horse is in right brain and freaking out and you see the whites of their eyes and they're backing up and they're scared, they literally think they're about to enter a death trap. To them, it's not like, oh, come on, dude, we've been on this 14 times, let's get going. Like something in their system has said, I actually think I might die, so I'm not gonna listen to you, Sharon, and I'm gonna freak out a little bit. So what we do is we, we speak to that. Oh, this is difficult for you, so let's work on this some. Same with kids with trauma. It's a life or death situation for them. If they're freaking out or if they're saying they can't do something, we take that at face value. We meet them where they're at. Uh, both horses and kids can be different. Uh, depending on the day, right? A horse can choose that even though we've crossed that same uh, tarp over the hay six times um, today, I'm pretty sure that's gonna kill me. And this is difficult for me. And we take, we meet them where they're at. We don't expect anything more of them and we simply accept them wherever they are that day. Same with kids with trauma. And, um, you work on dropping the agenda and letting it be their idea. So a lot of principles of natural horsemanship are like, you know, they'll take the trailer and even put it in the, um, put it in the pasture so the horse can get used to it and start getting curious. And then they decide they actually want to go look in the trailer. And then you go, oh, look at this. I've got a horse in the trailer. So letting it be their idea. Same thing with kids with trauma. They have a lot of issues, which we'll talk about with, with control, understandably. So telling these kids what to do or making it your idea is probably not going to be the most effective way of getting these kids to do something. So any way that we can kind of foster it being their idea is uh, more efficient. Okay, so benefits of equine assisted learning. This is huge because this program is non-clinical. People say all the time, like, do you need to be a social worker to do this? Or do you need to be a uh, mental health clinician, and no, the point of this program is to make it non-clinical because just like we accept kids the way they are and horses the way they are, people are good enough. In my experience, yes, they need to be trained. They need to um, agree to some things, but people are good enough as they come. So this is an alternative to therapy. There's no stigma here. Kids coming to the barn are excited about coming to the barn, and they usually even brag about it to other kids. I have had kids, uh, parents that say the reason why I'm signing my kid up for this session or for this program is because last time we were on her way to therapy, she jumped out of a moving vehicle. She's done doing therapy. I'm telling you, these kids, if they are in care, have been to more therapists than we can imagine as adults.
they typically know therapeutic language. So they know to come up and say, I got angry and I did my five breathing exercise and I hugged a pillow and then I walked outside in nature. So they understand clinical language. They know exactly what coping mechanisms you want to hear and they will report whatever you want to hear. So therapy, like traditional talk therapy that it's high pressure, you're looking face to face at each other is very difficult for these kids, for, for, for a lot of people. So this is alternative to therapy. You get to focus on a horse and um, take the pressure off. And then there's active engagement. The kids that come here, they want to be involved. They, um, as you'll see, they make their own plans. They're very involved. They think the horse is their own. So uh, the stable moments model is built on the I matter factor. Why would you make healthy choices if you didn't think you matter? I talked about this whole um, babies have lost their voice because they cried and nobody came. And that means that we can't say things to them like use your words. And uh, there's a really drastic example of, you know, a girl um, acting out and she's got a butcher knife to her mom's throat. And uh, people are saying, use your words. Yeah, um, not going to work because from the time she was zero to in utero to um, 10, her words didn't matter. So now the only way she can act out, now she's a 14 year old with a lot of uh, stature, physical stature, and she doesn't know how to use her words, nor do they, have they ever worked for her. So we need to build this voice, this I matter factor so that kids even have the opportunity to make healthy choices. We can't expect anything of them until we've proven that you're a safe adult that will listen. So how do we create I Matter? We do it through individualized plans, we do it through mentorship, consistent relationships, attainable goals, active engagement, and routine. And I'll go through each one of those in more depth. Now in uh, intake assessments that I've done over years of being a social worker for this population, these are, I, I don't see anything but these challenges. So these are all the challenges I see. Now, not every kid has every one of these challenges, but parents will come and act like um, this might be a new thing that their kid's doing. And I'm like, nope, this is about uh, par for the course. So these kids are impulsive, they lack confidence, they lack self esteem, they need control. So that leads to a lot of power struggles. They struggle to follow through with um, an activity um, or something that they commit to. They lack critical thinking, um, and that goes along with the impulsiveness. They just kind of act. They have a short fuse. They have an all is lost mentality. So when they, even if they just like couldn't tie their shoes that morning, they're like, oh, I shouldn't even go to school. Like, you know, all is lost. Beating themselves up. I'm so stupid. I suck at this. I'm not wanting to try. Emotional dysregulation, they're not able to regulate their emotions. They're very distracted and hyperactive goes along with that. And like I said before, they're easily triggered. So uh, what I did was I took all of the, um, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor or not, but I'm gonna use it and if not, you can just see uh, in this middle category, um, I took the challenges addressed and I put them in uh, different categories of which life skill would need to address that. So confidence would address low self-esteem. Assertiveness would address a kid that um, doesn't have much confidence or has low self-esteem. Um, so I basically made, took all the challenges and I put them into six categories. So there's six of these. And so you can see self-esteem, responsibility, self-regulation, emotional awareness, healthy relationships, and independence. So basically, um, if a kid comes to me with an, uh, in, during an intake and they have low self-esteem, control, and impulsivity issues, I know that we're going to work on slowing down. We're going to work on having them be able to trust and give up some of that control. We're going to work on their confidence, and they're going to be a red, blue, and green kid. So that's where the color coding comes in. So I've just done uh, the intake assessment. 
And the intake assessment doesn't just gather, I mean, of course, the intake assessment is like a conversation that you have with uh, the parent, the foster parents, adoptive parents, or case manager, and you're going to learn, you know, it's a pretty straightforward uh, sheet that I use, but it's like, what is the history, if we know it, a lot of times we don't know these kids' histories, uh, what are their, what are they good at, what are their interests, what do they like doing, uh, what are their challenges, so that last part I just showed you was their challenges. And then I'm going to take those challenges and I'm going to put them into a plan of care. Now the Stable Moments program is a 10 month program. So there's a short term goal and a long term goal. The short, short term is what we're gonna work on within the program. So maybe building trust with their mentor or getting them to follow through at the barn. And that's maybe a, 10, a five month plan. And then the 10 month long term plan usually has them starting to translate those skills to um, the home and community. So this is what the plans of care look like. I usually take that intake assessment form and everything that I've written down on it that they're energetic or they love horses or that they're really good at math or they're reading. Um, I put that in the, the top blurb. And the top blurb is supposed to be a positive snapshot so that when you get a mentor and you tell them this is your kid that they can see a positive snapshot we don't use negative language here um, so you can kind of see how i've written that it says may is an energetic engaging five-year-old foster girl who lives with her foster mom may is fearless and ready to take on any adventure she absolutely loves animals and cherishes her time out of the farm she'll need a sharp eye kept on her for safety as she is small and adventurous may does best with communi when communication is clear and transitions are planned out with her she will do well in a high with a high energy mentor who is structured and can keep her sessions engaging. And then we do list the concern. She struggles with listening and understanding limits, keeping her focused and follow through can be a challenge for her. So if the mom or parent or whoever has given you a whole laundry list of concerns, I boil it down to one or two sentences. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of the concerns kind of boil down to one area of life skill that they need to work on. Um, so then we go with some objectives. And usually when it's the kid, it's the first session that a kid's doing, like a first session year, um, these objectives are really uh, simple, like meeting with a mentor once a week, creating a plan once a week, completing one barn chore activity once a week. It just depends on... Um, uh, of what the plan of care goals are. So for, for May, for this kid, the short-term goal is that she will develop her listening skills and routine in the program by creating and sticking to a plan each visit. And she'll develop her sense of appropriate boundaries as she is redirected back to her own plan by her mentor. And then this kind of shows the focus colors based on the life skill color chart. So um, mentorship. It's weekly, it's the same person each week. So if you match up Cindy with Tom, it's gonna to be Cindy and Tom for 10 months. It's the same time each week. So we do not, if, if a parent calls and says, hey, I can't do three on Tuesday, but can you guys do 10 on Thursday? You're not gonna start running and looking for, seeing if your mentor can change times and what your schedule's like. Not only because that would be a nightmare for you and it's not fair to the mentors, but because these kids have a very difficult time with time. I mean, kids do in general, but these kids really have a difficult time understanding what time means. So it really needs to be reliable and stable for them. So same time each week, three o'clock, Tuesday at three o'clock, you're gonna come. If you can't make it, it's gonna be the next Tuesday at three o'clock. This fosters a relationship that they can count on. It builds trust and it builds that feeling of I matter because the mentor is waiting there for them, taking an hour out of their day or out of their week. So what makes a mentor? A mentor is simply an individual willing to create and maintain a safe environment that allows a special bond to develop between horse and participant. And they are also a horse advocate. So they are always going, we, we train them to stick up for the horse and talk all the time about what do you think the horse is saying there? Or how do you think that they like that activity and kind of always bringing in the horse's perspective. What a mentor is not, they're not, they're not fixers. They're simply here to facilitate the horse child relationship. They meet the child where they're at. They don't say like, oh, so I heard you've been through some stuff, buddy. And 
we're going to make it better. Like, no, we're like, Hey dude, how are you? And we just, we keep it moving. It's two people trying to figure out each other and, and hang out. Mentors are curious. They're empathetic. They're patient. They're consistent. They're well-trained and they pass a background check. So one of the things I talked about with building the I matter factor was attainable goals. Um, the kids that come uh, to this program or foster adopted kids in, in general um, need attainable goals to build a winning streak. So when I was a social worker, I often had parents have issues with the school because the, their kid was failing the fourth grade for the third time and it was because they couldn't understand long division and the parents would tell me, I do not care if this kid ever learns long division, but he needs to know the difference between a nickel and a dime. So um, our, our, our goal at Stable Moments is not like, we're gonna develop life skills and then they're gonna be super successful, blah, blah, blah. No, like we're going to give them a space where they can develop this feeling of I matter. And we're going to create a space where they can develop a winning streak. So if a kid comes to your barn and they're like super scared to even look at the horses or they're not that into the horses, and they don't think that they can do something, maybe that time like we just watch from a bench and we make observations about the horses. And then the next time we see if maybe they'll go up to the fence. And when they do that, we say like, dude, you said that you couldn't get close to horses, but we're getting a lot closer and you're doing awesome. And starting to demonstrate for them things that they can do because they feel like they just, they can't. So this is super practical. It gives them confidence to be able to start doing things in their life outside of the barn and it helps them understand that it's not all or nothing it's small baby steps in the stable moments program we use charms um, and each kid gets their own brush bag and they also get their own keychain that has their personalized name on it super important for kids uh, that are in foster care because they don't often have their own belongings we all hear about uh, kids that have to bring their belongings trash with in a trash bag from home to home. So this is like, this is your bag. Now we don't have them take it home. They do leave it at the barn, but I'll tell you, do not touch that bag or use it while they're gone because they will melt. And then we have charms that are on the bottom of each one of our activities. And so kids can earn charms. We don't do any gifts. Um, we have some rules about that, but this is a way in the program that they can get something and getting things for a kid that feels very empty and feels like they need to fill a void um, is really important. So this is a little way that we can give them a thing. Um, and then they put it on their keychain. Again, it stays at the barn. So active engagement. These kids see their horse as their own. We tell them that horse is yours on Thursdays at three. They know that that horse is just theirs and they can, they can um, expect that. They know that their horse is used by other kids, but not on Thursdays at three, that's their time. They take ownership of their role. We see kids start jumping out of the car and going to get the items that they need and um, going to grab their horse's halter. So they, they start talking about, oh, he's gonna need his fly spray. So they have ownership of their role and there's a place where they belong. Another huge thing for foster kids is having a place where they belong and that somebody's expecting them and there's somebody that needs their care. They're proud of what they learn um, and they are also often boasting about it. They wait all week. We have parents say like, um, my kid wakes up every morning and says, is it horse day? And they make their own plans. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but kids uh, make their own plans so that their, their sessions really are run by them. And then routine. Um, we're predictable, structured, and scheduled. So like I said, exactly same time each week, same mentor. Mentors waiting for them as they get out of the car. They make a plan each time. It's, it's structured enough. We drop the agenda enough so that we don't have our own expectations of how the session's gonna run. But it is the same time. It is, we're making a plan each time. It is the same horse. So they have this very predictable, um, they have, these sessions are very predictable for them and they can uh, rely on that. 
And the mentors are trained to be predictable, to be the same every time that they show up um, and to be very present. So this is a, um, one story I'll tell you about. So uh, this is a kid. Um, this is a kid that came to our program and he was, I think, nine days into his um, seventh foster home. And he had been drowned by his mom's boyfriend. And it, the drowning was enough for it to cause neurological damage. And he would, he, when he came, he was just so dis dysregulated. He was clicking a lot with his mouth. He was um, rubbing his hands together a lot. He was chewing on his collar. Absolutely no um, eye contact. His eyes were all over the place. You could literally tell like his, he was coming out of his body because he couldn't regulate himself. Um, so I matched him up with um, a mentor that I knew couldn't leave the program. This is my dad. Um, and my dad said, so what do I do? And I said, well, you hang out with him. We're just going to be here for him. So my dad said, okay, well, the child didn't want anything to do with him. Certainly didn't talk to him. And I, uh, the, there was two other kids that came at the same time. So I was, you know, helping with other sessions and I'd often look over and just see like the kid run and then a couple seconds behind my dad running behind him. And there goes the kid and there goes my dad. And it was like that for a few sessions. And um, at some point they found this big pile of dirt. And for those of you who know that like digging in dirt is a really good sensory activity. And this kid definitely had some sensory processing issues. So being able to sit in the dirt actually helped him kind of regulate his body. So they found this big pile of dirt. My dad actually ended up buying like, um, you know, those trucks that you can dig in the dirt with. And they started doing that for some of their sessions. So now my dad actually had him like in a setting where they could like sit and maybe talk. And through their conversations, and I'm talking like this is probably month two of sessions, through their conversations, they start to learn that they like both like Star Wars. And so um, although that we would typically not allow um, sword fighting at the barn, they picked up, they found these branches and they were their lightsabers. And they started doing this like lightsaber fights, whatever. You can tell that I'm not into Star Wars, but um, that's what they would do. And they even, uh, my dad brought like duct tape for them to decorate these and they started making their own sticks and the kids started coming and jumping out of the car and saying, did you bring your lightsaber? And I'm like sitting there like, oh my gosh, tell me that you brought your lightsaber. But my dad was like, yep, here it is in the trunk of my car. So they played this and we're probably in like month three now because this is how long it takes to build trust. And that's why this is a 10 month program. And my dad was able to say, hey, at some point he was able to say, hey, I would love to do lightsaber fighting with you, but Scooter, who is the horse, really could use a groom. I just saw him out there. He's so dirty and he expects us during this time. So do you think that we could just run a couple brushes over him um, and, the, and then we can get right to our lightsabers? And the kid was like, okay. And so they started grooming this horse. They started being able to walk this horse around and even like being able to slow down enough to use a curry comb and brush together and stand there was such a milestone for this kid. So that's just an example of like, I know a lot of programs are set up to be eight weeks long. For these kids, they really need as long stability as possible. I mean, Honestly, when I started this, I was like, mentors are just going to stay forever. There's no ending period. I, they need one stable adult through their whole life. Um, but I realized, you know, you have to let mentors off the hook at some point. So 10 months it is, it goes with the um, school year. But this was a example of if you hang in there, even if you feel like you're getting nowhere, like if you just show up for an hour a week and just hang out, sit on a rock and show the kid that like, I'm going to still be here every every week, um, you can start getting some really good results. I'm happy to report that that kid is doing so good. He was adopted in, into the family that, um, that brought him to stable moments and, and he's just thriving. Okay, so 
practical sessions. What are these actual sessions like? People, you know, like, what am I looking at when um, a kid actually comes to the barn? So a kid jumps out of the car, their mentor's there, they're waiting for them. They're gonna make a plan, first thing, before they do anything. And sometimes kids get super good at this and they know that they have to make a plan, so they jump out of the car and they go, I'm gonna groom, I'm gonna do the basics, then we're gonna throw the football. Okay, good, you made the plan, you're off and running. Other kids wanted to go and sit down and like write out their plan, so you did that. It doesn't matter, as long as you make a plan. So the plans usually are always with the child. The mentor is not going to say, this is what we're doing today, good luck with that. And you wanna give them an opportunity for this to be child directed. So um, it's gonna be with the child. And there's usually going to be a connection, a life skills, and a transition. Those are the three parts, so we'll go through those. So connection is usually grooming. It's a time for you to check in. Uh, obviously, if you have a kid that jumps out of the car and is kicking dirt and is kind of pissed off or whatever, you're not gonna say, okay, let's go get the horse and you know, not acknowledge that. Maybe you'll just go for a walk with that kid or say like, oh, did you wanna, you know, bring the horses their water buckets or something um, so that you can check in with the kid. And it's also time to um, concentrate energy. I'm actually glad that I picked this picture for this one because you can see that large van behind this little girl. That's how a lot of the families show up at the barn. You know why? Because people that foster kids are saints and they usually foster like 15 of them or like six. So a lot of them have these huge passenger vans with all these kids but that means that when the kids show up at your place, they just got out of a car, which I don't know, some, some kids, because of the barn setting, sometimes people have to drive like 45 minutes. They just got out of a car with a bunch of screaming siblings and a crazy car ride. Um, so it's just time to like chill and connect. And you know, some kids will do music, some kids do art, some kids do grooming. Um, this is a great time to demonstrate proper care, like we need to uh, groom the horse before we um, do activities with the horse because uh, that's what's fair and that's proper care for the horse. And then that's a great time for you to kind of like show them how you care for a horse or what you're looking for, like for cuts or wounds or anything like that that the horse needs. Great way to build empathy. Other times it can be like walking around or whatever, like I said. Then you're gonna do the equine assisted activity. This is the crux of your session, and this is what promotes um, development of life school skills, and they're chosen specifically for um, the, the kid's plan of care. So I'll bring you through this. Um, you guys may be familiar with Join Up. It's definitely not. It, it was coined by Monty Roberts, um, a great natural horsemanship um, expert. Um, this is so good for kids to do um, because it promotes emotional regulation, right? They have to go in the center and they have to um, ask this horse to move around. So they need to be controlling their energy. They need to be focused and they need to lift their energy up, like um, have bigger energy if they want the horse to move faster. And then they need to get small and have their energy be real soft if they want the horse to come back down to a walk. So teaching these kids like that they can be big and that they can be small is huge. Um, and Join Up allows you to do that. Teaches these kids assertiveness. Um, uh, I'll have a lot of kids that go into the center of the ring with a, with a flag and they do this little like, I, you can't see me so you can't see what I'm doing, but like they just barely wave the flag and they're like, come on. And so with those kids, you know, I might take the horse out of the situation and we do join up me and the kid. And I show the kid like, if I wave this little thing at you, do you want to move? And then I puff my chest out and point my arm and, and I move my arm really fast with where the flag would be. And the kid goes, <laughs> and I go, yeah, see, you wanted to move. So it teaches them assertiveness and how to use their body to lift their head up, bring their chest up and have a presence. And then getting that reaction out of the horse of actually walking forward really shows them that they do have some control, that they do have a voice. Okay, and then connection is a huge one. For those of you who are not familiar at all for Join Up, I want you to just go YouTube it after. Um, but at the end of Join Up, typically, depending on how you've trained your horses or whatever, but typically, even if you haven't trained them at all, because this is used to train horses, they come in 
to you. And it's this beautiful moment. Um, so, and then they um, are joined up with you. So as you walk around, the horse actually follows you. Um, beautiful for these kids to feel like they've made a connection. Um, definitely helps with impulse control. If you have a kid that like is all over the place, um, as long as it's safe, putting them in this situation really does make them have to focus on this situation. Uh, very relationship-based, and this can be repetitive, like can happen every single time. There's plenty of uh, experienced horse people that do join up with their horse every single time they start any work with their horse, um, just to set the relationship before they move forward. So we do have join up as one of our activities, but you can see this is kind of how they're set up. Um, it shows the different life skills. So there's the colors right there. So if you had a kid's plan of care and you knew that they were a yellow and orange kid or whatever, this would be a perfect activity for them. It tells you a, a setup, the prerequisites that you need to do. Like kids aren't just going in and doing join up. They do need to know um, the basics before they do that. So you have to finish um, mastering other activities before you do this one. So that would be the prerequisite sec section. And then the objective says, horse responds and connects to leaders requests for walk, trot, canter, and halt transitions without the use of a lead rope independently and consistently. And the reason we write it like that is because these kids in general, humans in general, wanna just like, yep, I did jo join up, check that off the button, and I get the charm and here we go. Well, it's gonna take a long time, even for a skilled person to get a horse they don't know to walk, trot, canter, halt out on the rail, doing all those transitions without a lead rope independently and consistently. So we always wanna be showing kids that like, these are things we work towards and mastery can take months and that's okay. Um, and that means that by the time they're earning the charm that it really means something and it show, shows them how to follow through with all of these activities and to keep working on things week to week. It's not just like a, if you get it done quicker, you're, it's better or something. And then we have discussions, like what was this like for the leader? What worked, what didn't, what feelings came up? What was the exercise like for the horse? And these are really important because I used to have mentors before we had activities or before we had discussions, they, I'd watch them go do an activity with the kid and then they're like, okay, I guess I did it. And then they're just like walking back to the barn. And I'm like, oh, what a huge missed opportunity. Like have a conversation about it. Like, and so I needed to give them some questions to, to spark that. Connected grooming, another one of our activities. Um, so this is um, a lot like grooming, but this is developing empathy and attunement to the horse's experience through grooming. So you're gonna use different brushes, you're gonna brush different parts of the knee, uh, different parts of the horse, and you're going to um, have the kid demonstrate their proper uses of the brush and the brush order, and also how they're attuned to the horse's reaction to each part of the grooming process, and then how they react. So like if a horse pins his ears back when you're getting his underbelly, okay, like what might we do then? Um, so that's a really good way too to kind of break, break some of these things down and make them therapeutic because what do a lot of people do? They're like, oh, I grabbed the horse, we brushed him, now we're done. So this is like, okay, well, how did you brush him? How did you use each tool? How did the horse react? Like we can break these things down to make them be more meaningful. And I'm just showing you some of the simple ones. Okay, because we've got 30 activities in our activities back pack. 16 of them are equine, 14 of them are, are um, non-equine. So um, other activities that we have are by a thread. That's where you walk a horse through certain obstacles, but you do it by a thread. So um, if there, you have an impulsive kid that like, you know, almost rips the horse's face off when they're trying to walk with them, then this is a good one because that when the thread breaks, you need to start over again. And these kids really like winning and getting things right. So this forces them, kind of makes the name of the game, slowing down. Let it go is where they paint something on the horse, something that, that's bothering them, maybe a big test that's coming up, a visit with their birth parent. They can paint it and then you wash it off. And as you wash it off, you're letting it go. We also have non-equine activities, as I mentioned. Um, there's plenty of kids that come to the barn and are not ready to be with a horse or their whole hour doesn't need to be with a horse. And a lot of this is building the mentor relationship. So I really love developing skills that 
they are good at. So we have kids that bring their guitar and play their guitar, or they want to journal, or they want to draw. This kid's playing with Legos, and it's a great time for them to share part of them with you. And then finally, there's a transition. So you've got your connection, you've got your equine assisted activity, and this is your transition. So you want to count down with kids. A lot of times they need a countdown. So we do not go over session. We don't say like, oh, well, this week we could do an hour and a half and it's kind of loosey-goosey. We want kids to be able to, it's fair to the horse, fair to the mentor, fair to you, and fair to the kid to keep it consistent. So one hour. So when you're getting, we have mentors, make sure that they are um, keeping time. And what's really important is, is if you've come up with a three-part plan, you better not, as a mentor, let the second part of the plan go to the hour and then say, okay, we're done. We don't have time for um, throwing the football like you asked. So you're keeping track of time and you're saying, hey, okay, we're going to wrap this up um, because we need to go throw the football, like was the third part of your plan. Now, if a kid says, I don't really care to throw the football. I want to keep doing this. That's totally fine. But you've acknowledged the plan. And you say, okay, so we'll keep doing this, but we're not going to do football. So in like another 15 minutes, we're actually done with the session. Is that cool? and you're checking in with them, they have control, right? And, and they're changing their plan up, that's fine. But as it's coming to the end of the session, you wanna count down, tell them there's 10 minutes left, five minutes left. If you have itty bitties, um, you know, little kids or developmentally um, like younger kids, then you, they may need more of a transition, like five minutes, four minutes, three minutes to 30 seconds, 10 seconds. Okay, and if they have a real difficult time with transition, like leaving the barn, I didn't have much of an issue with this, um, but if they do, then it's really helpful to have the transition be the exact same each week. So we had a swing at our farm where every kid loved the swing and they wanted to swing as their last activity. And for some kids, doing the swing every single time kind of like reminded them that this is what I do at the end and got their body ready for the transition out. Okay, so then they debrief. Now the kid has gone, it's the end of the session. Even if a kid and a family is like, oh, we're gonna hang around the barn or whatever, that's fine, but the session is over. So that's when the mentor says like, okay, I'm gonna go fill out my activity log and the mentor leaves and goes to the mentor area. Um, and this is when you know the program director can check in with the parents or um, talk to the parents before they leave if they need to. Um, this is where the program director can check in with their mentors. They all do activity logs during, um, during the session. So not during the session, but after each session, they do an activity log. And then we have a picture of Bruce cleaning up here, but um, hopefully kids have cleaned up after themselves and there's not much cleanup for mentors to do. So let me tell you about activity logs. Activity logs are super important for a lot of things, right? We want to prove that we're doing something and we want to prove that we're working towards the goals that we said we were going to um, work on. And we need to know what our mentors are doing and that they're understanding this whole thing. So this is just a quality check all around. So the activity logs look like this. Uh, you have the youth name, the mentor name, which horse you're using, whatever. The goal from the plan of care that you see here this is the exact same every single week. And I can't stress that enough. You'll notice when you have mentors uh, that they uh, come up with some random goals that they're working on that I'm like, where'd you come up with that? So I make it very clear that it's a goal from the plan of care. This is what's leading all of your sessions, remember? Okay, so they should, they should know that and put that on there, the same thing every week. And then they write their plan. And this helps remind mentors, remember, you're making a plan every time. I want to see it. Um, so the plan was groom Minky, work on the basics, archery, um, and then a log. And I teach mentors how to do these logs so that they're rich. I used to get um, logs that said, like, we took the horse out, groomed him, and then uh, walked him around and shot some arrows. I'm like, I know, that was your plan. Like, how do you work towards the overall goal? So um, logs usually look like, um, after some, some training with mentors, they usually look like Randy participated in making his own plan today. Minky was antsy during grooming today and Randy seems scared. I asked Randy what helps him to calm down, when, calm down and he said it's when his mom rubs his back. I suggested he rub Minky's back when she is antsy. He tried that and it seemed to work and we were able to continue grooming. 
Randy wanted to skip the basics and go straight to archery, but I reminded him of his plan and he was able to transition to the ba basics. Randy knows most of his basics, but got frustrated when trying to back Minky up and wanted to give up. I slowed him down and asked him to take it one small step at a time and encouraged him to just take a couple of back steps before ending. He was able to get a couple steps and then a couple more on his own. We then moved to archery and he got two bullseyes. He was proud of himself and I gave him a bunch of praise. He was a bit resistant to pick up the arrows that had been overshot, but with a little lighthearted encouragement and reminding him it was his job, he willingly found them all. This is very rich, right? And it tells us, shows us totally how they worked on listening and following through with a plan during um, their session. This is also where mentors can write questions or comments or what they might do next week. Um, and so that as a program director, if you're, you know, uh, if you're looking over these, you can ask, you can ask questions or answer questions for them. So tracking progress. So um, how do we track progress of how these kids are doing? Well, we take the activity logs and we create progress summaries out of them. So if we have rich activity logs like that, we can make a summary of their progress at the five month mark and at the um, 10 month mark. Um, and then we can have the parents sign off on that, the mentors sign off on that. We do data collection, which is a pre and post test on their life skills, like how they are entering the program and how their um, life skills have developed through the program. And also you can track mentor and participant retention. This is an additional program option. So I've, I've created this so that it can be implemented anywhere. It can be an additional income stream because um, at my program, Department of Children and Families, we're paying the kids program fees. Um, I had my program charging um, $200 a month per child. Um, so, and if Department of Children and Families, it's different in every county and every state, but there's also, um, it's a great fundable program for sponsors and donors. Um, community referring agencies often have um, money. So, there's ways to get your program fees. And then adopt, I had adoptive parents self pay as well. Uh, this is an unmet need. We're not having, we don't see a lot of programs for foster and adopted kids specifically that's really in, uh, trauma informed. And what's really cool about it is you only need one person running it because you have um, all mentors, it's volunteer run. So the Stable Moments books is a A to B, like nuts and bolts. If you were like, so how do I do that? It like walks you through exactly how to do it. And you could take the book and go start a mentorship program on your own. You just start your own Betty Sue's mentorship. Um, and this is what I thought I was going to do was just release a book and people would be able to serve more kids. But what ended up happening was um, people needed more support. Like, People were like, okay, I know you write about it, but I can't just like read it and do it. Um, so the certification training actually walks you through like workshops of how do we do interviews? How do we do intake assessments? How do we take those intake assessments and create plans of cares out of them? How do we take activity logs and create progress summaries out of them? How do we train mentors, right? Like that's a big deal. So um, I realized people kind of needed a more in depth training for all the questions I got after people bought the book. So um, this is, you can get certified in the Stable Moments uh, model, and it's a two-day training that teaches you how to be a program director, basically, of this program. And benefits of the certification are you get your first year free. It's a member portal, so you, you get um, to be a Stable Moments uh, member. And um, that means that you have unlimited access to our program assets. So like all the things I've been talking about, the templates for plans of care, the templates for life skill category worksheet, enrollment paperwork, intake assessments, like we have so many administrative assets. Those are all just like templates that you're able to use. We also have like media assets. So graphics to um, uh, solicit participants. We've got sponsorship packets, everything that videos to promote the program. So everything that you would need to kind of um, promote the program um, and be successful. <clears throat> that's all in the member and member portal. 
And then um, we have monthly member calls so that you always have access to other people that are doing it and access to me. And I, also, I usually give a one hour training during the member calls so that I'm keeping you guys um, up to date on any trauma informed practices or um, things we, you can do with your mentors or nonprofit development stuff. Um, access to a community forum. So we have a forum in the member portal. You can use the certi uh, Stable Moment certified logo get your member profile on the Salem Moments website. And the big one is that you're eligible to enter into a license agreement to be a Stable Moments site. So once you have done the Stable Moments certification, you are able to enter into a license agreement. Like if you're associated with a barn, the certification is you individually. So Betty Sue is Stable Moments certified. If Betty Sue is the executive director of Betty Sue's Equine Therapies, Betty Sue's Equine Therapies can license into a, an, a license agreement, enter into a license agreement to be a Stable Moments location. And that's included in the cost of your certification training. Um, and then you get 20% off all Stable Moments products. Okay, so let me end with some case studies. This is Wesley. Um, Wesley came to the program so sweet, so um, meager, and kind of um, just quiet in his shell. But boy, when you like, and he looked down at the ground a lot, but when you said his name, he lit up. Like you could just see like, oh, you're talking to me? Um, and he was the sweetest, sweetest kid. So he developed this relationship with Minky, and that's Minky right there. And um, he started, he was excelled with her, was able to do join up, was doing a lot of natural horsemanship, kind of advanced stuff. Well, we ended up getting a pig. Um, and if you don't have pigs, don't get one. Um, because Minky was so afraid of this pig that she became like Miss Crazy Pants. And um, she was not okay to be in sessions. She was like snorting all the time and her whites above her eyes were always showing. She lost her hair. She was starting to get ulcers, like rearing on when we were walking her in from the pasture, like not the minky we knew. So she became unsafe and we had to make a decision about not, um, not having Wesley be with her in her session anymore. And I, we said, you know, we'll match you up with another horse while we get this figured out. And he was like, oh no. I'm, you're not taking me away from Minky. He was like, I will be there for her. So he sat, we couldn't let him be with her or even handle her, but he sat near her in the whole hour, talked to her. I know you're scared. I know that pig is scary. I would be scared too. It's okay to be scared. I mean, the language he used is so beautiful. And he did that for several weeks, handing her hay through the slats in the fence and finally we got the pig rehomed we found him like a pig rescue and he went there and he looks amazing and he has a girlfriend now so the pig's doing great but um minky started to come around without having the pig, the pig there anymore but she was still a little like halfway timid we weren't really feeling great about her being in sessions with with all kids so we asked wesley do you want to help us train Minky back to get her back to where she was? And he was like, absolutely. So he started um, doing join up with this horse and he was um, working with her and getting her to trust again. And we were getting her um, treated for her ulcers and her hair started coming back. But the really cool part of the story is that Wesley had no friends when he came to us. He had never had a friend, never. He just kind of hung out with his adoptive parents. Um, wasn't the cool kid in school, kind of got bullied. And through this process, he was so proud of himself and proud of his mayor, Minky, that he wrote an essay about working with her and her accomplishments and how she overcame a really, really scary pig. And he read that essay aloud to his class and his class loved it so much that they wanted to see what he was doing at the barn. So we ended up having a birthday party for him and um, six kids from his class came to his birthday party and they got to witness him moving this big horse around this round pen. And um, I can't tell you how much confidence and, and um, uh, self-worth he gained. And he also gained friends and it was really a beautiful moment. 
this is uh, Daniela. She was actually the only child that we had in the program that was a bio child, a uh, biological child. Her biological parents were bringing her, but she had spent a couple years in foster care because it was somebody in the family that lived in the home that had perpetrated on her. So they needed to take her out of the home until they got that situation resolved. She had trauma um, simply from having to be in foster care away from her parents for a couple years, of course. So um, this was her working with her mentor. That's the uh, buy a thread activity there. And this is um, from her mom. Our daughter, our daughter was experiencing nightmares due to unresolved emotions surrounding her time in foster care. Her love for horses encouraged us to look into equine therapy. Her nightmares have drastically decreased from almost daily to once every few weeks at most. We have, almost noticed, we have also noticed a reduction in her big emotional moments where she is talking about things more instead of just letting her emotions get away with her. She countdowns the days between sessions. And if you can see, this is actually, Daniela drew this. This is Daniela's little um, boot print and her mentor's boot print, and she drew a little heart around it. And that's them. You see her a lot of on a lot of our media assets because she's just so dang cute. Okay, and then finally, this is Thomas. He came to our barn. He couldn't care less about horses, um, and he didn't want anything to do with the barn. Really, really sweet kid, but he didn't really care to be there. And he had four siblings, so or three. He was one of four, so three others came at the exact same time. Single mom adopted four of these kids. So um, his mentor, Nick, who was absolutely awesome, recognized that this kid couldn't care less about horses and started asking him, what are you interested in? And um, Tom was like, I'm interested in science. So Nick, this mentor, went on Google and Pinterest and tried to figure out what science experiments he could do. And this mentor brought all the um, supplies you needed to make these little lava lamp things that you see. And they were able to like do these uh, activities that allowed Thomas to feel like he mattered and that he um, had an interest that was worthy of something. And Nick and him built these things and got to know each other over developing Thomas's interests. And this is just a really cool example of how um, a mentor can, you know, I, I wouldn't have had that stuff at the barn. But these mentors start to take on ownership of these kids. They have one kid to think about, so it's a lot easier for them to pour their heart into one. So Nick did this, and uh, <clears throat> this is actually Scooter again. Um, and uh, eventually, we got Thomas in the ring doing some join up. And when he came out for the first time, he said, I learned how to bring my energy down. That's a first. So I was like, well, that's a quote I'm grabbing because that's exactly right. That's what we're doing here. So that's the Stable Moments program. I want to let you know that we have a podcast. We just launched it. Um, if you have any parents, foster adoptive parents that you're already serving um, or for yourself or anybody, um, this is a resource uh, that you guys can, can offer people or listen in yourself. The book is on the website. And I will open it up for questions. I also want just to, sh I'm gonna leave this, um, I'm gonna leave this up, but our certification training dates are here. Uh, we've got four coming up this, this year. All right, I'm ready whenever you guys are ready. Okay. Oh, I like this question. So it says, you're not to take this time away as punishment. Do you make mentor choices as of male, female based on any information you are aware of? Yes. Yes. Love these questions. Okay. So no, we never take this away as punishment and you will have parents that will want to, right? I'm sure you've dealt with this. So um, we just have those conversations with parents upon intake. And if it ever happens um, during, we say, this is not fun time for your kid. Like this is something that they really need. And if they're acting up at school and at home, they probably need the barn more. That this isn't like, um, this isn't play. This is really uh, their healing time and that this is gonna help them. So we try to explain that at the beginning. And I really, I become vocal. Like I really push for that. If a parent's like, 
well, she's not going to get her horses today. I really just try to provide trauma-informed resources for parents so, they, so that they can start understanding why we do what we do. Um, those parents I might sit with more for the whole session. What's nice is you have mentors doing this work um, while you're there, so you can spend the whole hour with parents that need that extra support. Um, and then do you make mentor choices as a male, female based on any information you're aware of? So I'm going to be honest. The mentor application packet that we have is a long packet and it collects all their interests and blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, the, the thing that matches kids and mentors up the most is availability. So I make sure that you get all the kids availability, you get all the mentors availability. I do not ask parents like, what day works for you? I don't do that. I just say like, you know, hopefully we can find you a mentor. I need to know all of your availability. And that way you have some, hopefully you have more, more mentors than just one to match that kid up with. But yes, I haven't ever matched a man up with a young girl, usually because I have plenty of boys in the, in the um, program and it's hard to get male mentors and a lot of those kids don't have male role models. So I am quick to give um, our men to boys in the program. But yeah, I mean, I've had to make decisions like, I know this is a five-year-old that's running around, so I'm gonna put her with this college age. But this boy, Wesley, was you know um, paired up with a 70-year-old woman, and they did great. So you know, at some point, you have to let um, the cards fall as they may. Okay, are there other reasons for 10 months besides it follows the school schedule and it takes time to develop the relationships? No, I mean, you could do six or, you know, there hasn't been research to, be, to, to test 10 months. Um, <clears throat> so I like 10 months. I feel like um, men, uh, programs start to say, like, there's no way I could expect 10 months. And I really want to get that thinking out because um, you can expect whatever you expect. And in my mentor trainings, I make it really clear that they are signing up for one week, one hour a week for 10 months, and if they can't make it, we don't want them to commit, and that there's other ways they can get involved. And usually people get it, but I am like, you have to show up. Like there's no, this isn't a willy-nilly like volunteer position. And I, do, I, I make it so strict in the mentor training about why one hour a week for this kid is important that I do get committed mentors. Um, but I, I don't, um, I don't have like research behind 10 months, <clears throat> but I will say that we are doing research on the model. We're in the uh, research design phase and we'll be doing uh, that pre post test. Um, we'll be doing it at like three and a half months and we'll be doing it at five months and eight months or whatever. So we will be able to actually kind of see when we're starting to see improvements in kids and, and, and hone that in a little bit. Um, okay. Are most print programs set up as nonprofit or for profit? Most of the ones I deal with are nonprofit, but we have we have plenty of for profit. It, it doesn't matter. Um, what strategies do you use to recruit mentors from the community? Oh, well, I go to depending on you know your community and what it looks like. Facebook is huge, and I say like become a mentor. I have all the like marketing assets. Um, and all the language that you would use, but um, Facebook is a, is a big one, social media. Um, I even put flyers up, like in the local Starbucks or community organization, YMCA, places that volunteers typically are. Um, uh, at the local schools, um, seeing if parents that are there want to be mentors, and then a huge one for me was church. Uh, going around to different churches, and I would ask if I could just get up and talk for five minutes, at the end of a sermon or before a sermon and tell them that we need community mentors. And I was almost always allowed to do that. I got a lot of mentors from the church. Um, do you ever do EAL sessions as part of their program? Oh. Um, I, I think that you could do this. This is saying like something similar to EGALA or PATH or um, so yeah, I think that you could do this. Um, it's just like doing any other activity. 
The only thing would be like if that EAL session specifically had like a real, if it had any anything that goes against like the the approach and the trauma informed principles that we use. But I don't I don't see there being um, I don't see there being a problem with that, except if it wasn't a one on one mentorship type situation. Um, so we really do push the one-on-one. -on -one. I get a lot of people that say like, do you do group sessions and can you bring this? And it's really important that these kids have their own special person, their own special time. If you can't get funding from the agency, do you always have parents pay or do you not charge? I never not charge. I never not charge. But I have had parents pay $10 a month. But if I'm showing up and a mentor is showing up, you can pay $10 a month. Um, I always charge my program fees of um, on a monthly basis. I did not do like when you show up, you pay. This was like a gym membership. You're gonna pay me 200 bucks or whatever we've decided was your nominal fee. I use a sliding scale fee and that's um, something that's in the administrative assets. But you're gonna show up and uh, on the first, you're gonna be debited for the amount. And then whether you show or not, you get billed. And the way that I was able to do this through 10 months was most um the only weeks i took off were thanksgiving and christmas and there's a couple months that have five months five weeks in them so it all evened out but it was always um it was always the same each month so that you don't have to deal with like trying to figure out if they showed up and what to charge every time um but even if your parents are going to pay $10, they better know that the cost of the program is $200 a month or $400 or whatever your allowable amount is. You go off of what a Department of Children and Families may, may pay you as an allowable amount or whatever you've decided is your, your value is. So I, I was saying that it was $200 a month, which kind of equaled out to about $50 a session. And parents knew if they were getting, everything was a discounted rate off that. So at least they knew the value they were getting. This isn't a $10 service. It costs us a lot more. Um, okay, and then uh, what resources have you come across to pay for this program? Um, so again, um, sponsors uh, that you can reach out to, uh, Department of Children and Families directly, other referring agencies. So they're usually like community behavioral health pay for some. It really depends on the, the county that you're in. Um, but I will say, once you get hooked up as a vendor in those systems, um, you are much more likely to get paid. But one mistake a lot of people make is they go, I went to Department of Children and Families and I asked them to become a vendor and they, they said that they wouldn't help me. And they're not going to. You usually have to be serving a kid so that you can say, listen, I have Bobby Brown at my program, we're giving him these services, and then you can go to Bobby Brown's case manager, and you can bring it to Bobby Brown's case manager, supervisor, and you can fight to get him the services he needs. But without a particular kid that you're fighting for, and you're just like, I'd like Department of Children and Families to start paying me for some program that I don't have yet, very difficult. I've never heard of somebody being able to go that route. Um, so, um, okay. Where do you get most of your kids? Approach the agencies, word of mouth, everything. Other foster parents, uh, Facebook groups that speak to adoptive foster parents. Churches often have great people that have foster adopted. So you can say that this, when you're pitching it to churches for mentors, you can also pitch it to churches for participants. Um, and uh, the schools, I definitely try to get like a lunch and learn uh, scheduled with Department of Children and Families so that they understand um, all the local nonprofit organizations. Um, somebody said they came in late and asked how long I have done this. Um, it has been over six years I've been doing this. So do you find that mentors need previous? No, I'm so glad you asked. Pre no, in fact, some of the worst mentors are horse people because they are trying to teach the kid everything. Um, and people that don't know about horses get more curious and they have more caution. So rather than just picking the horse's hoof up and saying, this is how you do that. It's like, oh, this is kind of difficult. Let's get curious and see, um, let's get curious and ask Rebecca how we should do this. And it kind of shows a kid how to navigate a situation where you don't know what you're doing and you learn together. Um, so of course they do get some horse training. 
uh, the mentor training that we teach you to do is one day classroom, one day on site with your mentors. So you do teach them how to be with a horse, but you're going to be there for the first several sessions. Um, or I mean, you're going to be there for all the sessions, but you're going to be really hands on for the first several so that you know that they have a good handle. And look, they, they're not going right into join up right away. Like the first activity is basics. So that's like, you know, walking a horse. Um, so the kid and the mentor can learn together. Um, again, six years on how long I've been doing this. Um, do non-equine activities need to be in a place where it's just the mentor and child or can it be a room area shared with other mentors and children? <clears throat> you just need to be mindful of space. I mean, um, I, I had, um, I always blocked out a space that we could do non-equine activities, but if we had like four kids at a time there and there were kids that shouldn't be together, then I had the mentors kind of plan like, I'm gonna be in the grooming stall while you're in the arts and crafts area. And then later when we move out to the round pen, you can go in there. So sometimes it took some toggling. Other times it was completely fine. Two mentor, a mentor and a kid and another group could be in there and they were able to not be distracted. Usually they're more distracted by sibling groups. Like if it's two siblings, um, you have to usually use more caution to keep them separate. Okay. I really, oh, have you done siblings together? when there are relationship difficult absolutely but they have their own mentor and they have their own horse and you only would take on that if you have a property that's big enough where one can be in the arena and one you know you just keep them as separate as you possibly can so are they just working with uh mentors or what does that fully look like with equines when you transition to being not as involved what does that look like well it's just the mentor and the kid and the horse so they just start to get to know each other. They know how to make their plans and the, the kid just hops out of the car. And most of the time they don't even know who you are because they were there for their mentor and they go and make a plan. And the plan says that they're gonna go, um, you know, groom the horse and then they're gonna work on the basics and then they're gonna throw the football. And they know how to groom their horse and they know how to go work on the basics and they know how to throw a football. So, you know, you can be in the office at that time and you just teach them to come and get you as they need it. But um, they, they become pretty competent on their own pretty quickly. Um, will the parents usually take their children out of school for sessions or always after school? Well, believe it or not, a lot of adopted kids are in homeschool. That's what I noticed. So those are the ones that do during the day. And I'll tell you, adoptive families are great to um, market to because you know that they're not gonna be removed from the home. Uh, they're usually more stable, meaning that they'll definitely bring the kids to sessions. They possibly are in a better situation to be self-pay. So I had at least um, half, if not 75% of my kids were um, in their adoptive families. Um, what type of insurance should you have? Is that's just something that you need to, um, I had general liability, um, but, uh, and I had to, be PATH certified to be able to get the insurance that I had, um, but you'll have to look into insurance companies specific to that. Any more questions? Um, yes, the mentors are just volunteers, although some people are starting to charge their mentors um, to be involved, which I, I have nothing against that. Um, and how much equine background do you ask? Uh, none. They don't have to have any equine background, but they do need to complete a training, which is like a full, uh, you know, four hour onset train, on site training um, that they have to do. The certification training is $950. That's two days. Um, like I said, that covers your one year annual membership for all of our media assets and all of our marketing assets and uh, admin assets. And then it also covers one year of your license agreement to become a stable moments location. Children never ride the horses. Good question. This is all groundwork. And if you haven't read it yet, go onto the stable moments website and look at the blog post, why can't I ride? And that will be my answer to that. 
um, because just it doesn't mean that you can someday work up to that, but I really want you to be thinking of unintended consequences of what that means. Um, when a kid finally rides, are they now riding? They're certainly not doing it with just a mentor, so now you need more people to help them ride. You just don't, this program isn't set up to have um, riding instructor, therapeutic riding instructors um, ready. Um, do you stop at groundwork or you allow students to do rhythmic riding? I, I mean, what I would say is if you feel like a kid really needs to or is ready for or could benefit from, then have them do that service on another day. But their stable moments time is them doing their mentorship time, and that's when their mentorship comes. And then it's a different set of program fees and a whole different thing for them to be enrolled in a rhythmic riding program. I would make them separate. Um, and, or you can graduate them. Like, I think that riding's more beneficial to this kid. I'm gonna graduate them from stable moments service. Uh, renewing membership each year, it's a hundred bucks, so it's less than ten dollars a month. It's like eight dollars a month um, to do the, to have access to the member portal, and um, the certificate or the license agreement to be a stable moments location and to license the brand is um, four hundred and fifty dollars a year. Um, but again, that's two kids in your program one month, uh, so you should be able to cover that pretty easy. Um, do I have info to present to LPCs? Um, I don't know what you mean, like trauma-based info or, or info to, oh, like about the Stable Moments program. There's, um, depending on what they would be looking for, there's some promotional videos and stuff. I'm going to be passing out this recording to everybody that came, so you can give them this recording. Um, stable moments to CPS. Do you have any info to present to CPS? So when you become a um, stable moments location or certified, part of the a um, assets that you have access to are all of our like pitch decks and all that stuff. So like you and all the notes that go with the PowerPoint presentation so that you can go to Department of Children and Families you can go to your church and you have a PowerPoint presentation that's right there with all the notes that you need to say. So yes, uh, we have the, the stuff that you need to promote, if that's what you're talking about. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, I hope this has been informative. I hope that even if you're not gonna start a mentorship program that you learn something um, and that, that we can serve these kids better and maybe interact with them a little bit better when we see them. And um, that's my goal here is to serve as many kids um, and get the community at large to understand trauma a little bit better. So thank you so much for listening, guys. And um, uh, you can personally email me, Rebecca at StableMoments.com. Um, and I will be sending out this recording shortly. I'm also gonna send out a little survey. I love to hear feedback um, so that I can better serve you guys better uh, next time when I do these types of things. So, all right. Love you guys. Have a great rest of your week, which is like, what, a couple hours? And a good weekend. Bye.